Hello, this is Father David, here with day 25 of Great Lent 2023. The meditation today is from Metropolitan Anthony Bloom in his work, Churchianity versus Christianity. And just a side note, I would recommend to anyone and have many times, uh, Metropolitan Anthony's two books on prayer, Beginning to Pray and Courage to Pray. And if uh, you are looking to further your life of prayer or even just begin a life of prayer and you don't know where to start, I find that those two books, they have been classics for years, very much worth investigating. But today we're gonna be reading an, a, a meditation on living the liturgy, if I could put it that way. The meditation reads thus, but in order to be a Christian, to be able to pronounce the words of the creed, to say the Lord's Prayer, to participate in the liturgy, we must at least determine not only to have a validity, but a determination firm and clear to live the words that we pronounce, to live our whole life on Christ's own terms. Otherwise, we are only spectators of the life, of the crucifixion, of the death of Christ. We are onlookers, interested listeners, who may well be moved by one thing or another, but like the barren earth or the roadside of the parable, we may well receive the seed for a moment or not receive it at all. And then, however much we proclaim our faith as an objective intellectual truth, it does not reach us. And this is a very important thing for us to realize and to remember, because that is how we all live, more or less, except the saints. And this is something that I think we need to come back to every Great Lent, every fasting period, every time that we're meant to focus in especially on the spiritual life. There are some uh, strands of Christianity that are decidedly, and they came about strictly not to be liturgical. They rejected any kind of liturgy, any kind of set worship. Everything was meant to be spontaneous uh, off the top of your head. And this was how in their mind you uh, truly showed God that your heart was given over to him. I grew up in a, a, tr a tradition like that, a couple of them. And you, know, you come to something like the Orthodox Church, and it's very easy to fall into what Metropolitan Anthony, himself an Orthodox Christian his entire life, but a man of deep sense of what this meant, what he's saying here. He says, we, we shouldn't only have a valiety. That's a, a word that means just sort of a, a half-hearted uh, determination. Something that, you know, you, you understand that, oh, I, I probably ought to make a change. I ought, probably ought to live a little bit differently, but you don't have what he then says, a determination firm and clear to live the words that we pronounce. And so, you know, we, we have this, sense of a liturgy and motions that we can go through. And sometimes people in these other religious traditions, God bless them, but they say, you know, you don't want dead ritual. And they'll look at the liturgical life of the church and say, that's, that's dead ritual. What I usually tell people is that, you know, a ritual can't be dead or alive. It can only be true or false. Now we have to be careful when, when we say that because I, and I, I pause and I really appreciate where, his, uh, where, where Metropolitan Anthony says, uh, however much we proclaim our faith as an objective intellectual truth, it does not reach us. So we can go back in history. We can look at the liturgy. We can look at its development. We can see how it's rooted in the early church. And we can even prove it through documents from the early church fathers. We can show all this and that's true. We can even look back in history and find <coughs> very early evidence for the likelihood of Christ's resurrection. And all of that is wonderfully intellectually stimulating. But if it stays there and we don't have, along with the ritual of worship, not living or dead ritual, but living people, people who are alive to Christ, praying true ritual, 
then what God is wanting to have happen through his church will not happen. And we can't judge this, by the way, according to emotional response. Sometimes it might happen. We've talked about that in another video. An emotional response can be one of the most beautiful, memorable things that we can have. I've seen it in the regular divine liturgy, on Pascha, and throughout the year. That's beautiful when it happens. But for us, we need to align our lives with the liturgy. This is why we need to pay attention to what we're saying in the liturgy. Maybe get a copy of a liturgy book and read along. We have a few in our church in the back that people will sometimes pick up and be reading through as the liturgy goes. And that can be something that awakens in them a sense that, you know, we are giving thanks. That's what Eucharist means, the name for the Holy Communion. Thanksgiving. We are giving thanks to a being to a tri-personal Godhead for making us, for sustaining us, for helping us, for sending down the Son and Word of God to become one of us. And then once this happens, to die for us, to descend into the place of our shared, what was our shared destiny, the grave and death and Hades, and to pull out all of the dead that were waiting for him and tell to us that our destiny is different now. That this is what ought to color our coming into not only corporate worship with the liturgy or vespers or whatever it happens to be, but in our icon corners with our prayer ropes. We ought to remember that this is what we were created for and to align our hearts, our thoughts, our actions, our words, with what we're praying. So that as we live out the words of our faith, we will align ourselves more and enrich exponentially our enjoyment of, understanding of, and benefit from the life of worship that God's called us to in this church. So the Lord God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.